Hello. In this video, we are going to talk about uh, frequency compensation of a system. And the whole purpose of frequency compensation is to bring a system from a point where it is an unstable or marginally stable system uh, and, and convert it into a system that is stable. And uh, hopefully that it has a sufficient gain and phase margin to guarantee stability, uh, even if there are disturbances in the system. In order to uh, explain that, I have drawn the block diagram of a typical three-stage op-amp. Um, for a typical op-amp, there's typically going to be a differential uh, input stage uh, formed by a differential amplifier. An op-amp typically has a differential uh, input, uh, followed by a gain stage. Uh, and finally, there's typically an output stage. So that will be a simple representation. Uh, it can be shown that the frequency response uh, of the op-amp is going to be determined um, or mostly determined by the two uh, poles that arise at the interfaces between stages. And so basically, um, the two main poles determining uh, the frequency response Are going to be determined um, by the since the, the location of the poles is going to be dependent on the resistance and capacitance. Uh, they're going to be uh, determined by the resistances and the capacitances seen at those interfaces, the equivalent resistance and capacitance seen at those interfaces. So are dependent on the equivalent resistance and capacitance um, at the interfaces between stages. Now in here we're obviously talking about uh, not any coupling or bypass capacitors, uh, but rather internal capacitances, the capacitance that are determining the high frequency response of the amplifier. Notice that I I have not included when I have drawn for an op-amp the magnitude of the frequency response. It doesn't look like a bandpass amplifier uh, because, meaning there is no low cut of frequency. The reason for that is op-amps are typically designed as DC coupled amplifiers where they, they allow the DC uh, signals through the DC voltages. Uh, so that's why the response. They're still limited on the high end by their internal capacitances and so forth. So uh, they resemble the frequency response resemble um, that of a low pass filter. All right, so obviously uh, the equivalent resistancing in those interfaces are going to be uh, the output resistance of the previous stage and the uh, input resistance of the subsequent stage. And then there's going to be an equivalent capacitance uh, seeing in each interface. So for a three stage amplifier such as this one, uh, there are going to be two uh, major uh, two poles that define majorly the frequency response of the amplifier, and those are going to be the poles um, that are determined by the resistances and capacitance seen at those two interfaces between stages one and two and between stages two and three. So I have drawn um, the, the frequency response, a generic frequency response for a three-stage op-amp system. Uh, in terms of the magnitude response, again, I have put the two uh, dominant poles, FP1 and FP2. Um, and the idea is the gain will be relatively constant uh, up until hitting the first pole. Um, that pole will basically determine the location of the high cut of frequency. And then the gain will start to decrease um, until it hits the second pole and then decrease at a higher rate. As far as the phase uh, in the midband region, for the passband region, uh, it's going to be zero degrees. I haven't indicated it, but... Um, and then by the time uh, you hit the first pole, it's going to be sitting at minus 45 degrees. And um, it's going to decrease from about one-tenth that frequency to 10 times that frequency of the first pole. It's going to go from zero to negative 90 degrees. And then it's going to sit at negative 90 degrees until it reaches a frequency of about one-tenth uh, the second uh, pole location, one-tenth of FP2, where it's going to start decreasing again. Uh, it's going to hit negative 135 degrees at the location of FP2. 
um, and then go um, all the way to negative 180 degrees uh, at about a frequency 10 times FP2. That's just uh, the standard behavior of the standard body plot uh, for a two-pole system. Now, in order um, to guarantee stability or in order to have a stable system, we want that by the time we hit that zero dB point in magnitude, we want to be at a point where we have not hit um, 180 degrees yet in our phase shift. Uh, so basically, to guarantee stability, we will want to hit zero dBs um, at a point where we have not yet hit 180 degrees. Uh, in this system, it's pretty unclear, but let's imagine that we didn't meet that condition or we just barely meet that condition so we have a marginally stable system. Uh, one possible way that we can uh, introduce more stability in the system is by deliberately shifting the poles. Um, and the, the generic term for basically changing the frequency response of a system in order to ensure stability, changing the location of the poles, uh, that's term frequency compensation. So we can apply frequency compensation to the system in order to modify the pole location uh, locations in order to um, guarantee stability. And the technique that we are going to learn is one of the common techniques, not the only one, but one of the common ones to uh, perform frequency compensation is by using the dominant pole approach. So basically we're going to be shifting the first pole and we're going to shift it uh, enough to, to the left, basically decreasing the bandwidth of the amplifier enough uh, so that the system will we will force it to hit um, uh, the zero dB gain. Uh, it's at exactly the point where it hits the FP2 location, at which point it will be sitting at negative 135 degrees, so below our 180 degrees. Let me write that down so it uh, starts making some sense. So uh, we have said that in order to guarantee the stability, stable system, we can deliberately modify uh, the frequency response. I'm going to write this modify frequency response because it is a more general term. And this is called frequency, performing frequency compensation. And then one method of frequency compensation method is the dominant pole method or pole splitting. And that's basically consists of uh, shifting the first pole to a sufficiently low frequency uh, so that the system basically behaves as a single pole system. So shifting um, first pole to a sufficiently low frequency So that um, so that gain becomes unity that is zero dBs at exactly the location of pole. Pole two, second pole. FP two, where the phase shift at FP two is equal to one hundred and thirty-five degrees, and therefore, since I am hitting 
my unity gain before hitting uh, the 180 degrees phase shift, I have guaranteed stability with a phase margin of 45 degrees, uh, which is how far I am from 180. Uh, let's go ahead and draw it in the system so that we visualize graphically what it is that we are doing. So basically we are shifting FP1 to a sufficiently low frequency, so we are moving it here. This is after my frequency compensation, so I'm going to refer to this as FP1 prime. Um, and I want to put it at a location so that I'm going to hit the location of FP2 at the time uh, by the time I reach 0 dBs. So basically I'm hitting it right there. Uh, I'm going to try to... And again, this graph is not extremely accurate because if it were... Uh, both um, this slope and those slope should be equal to each other. But you get the picture. Um, at least we're hitting FP2 at the right at the right point. And again, at that point, my phase shift is equal to um, 180 degrees, and therefore my phase my phase margin is going to be um, 45 degrees, right? And my gain margin will be whatever it is. Um, the difference between that and 180 degrees. Um, how do I implement that in practice? Well, if you remember, uh, the way we control those uh, frequency responses, uh, the location of those poles determine the bandwidth of the amplifier. And the location of those poles was basically, generically, 1 over 2 pi RC. Right? Uh, for every capacitor, uh, we had a pole which was located at the, um, at the frequency determined by 1 over 2 pi RC, R being the 7 in resistance seen across the terminals of that capacitor, if you remember from our frequency response of amplifiers lectures. Um, and so if we wanted to lower this frequency, we have two options. We can um, increase our resistance or increase our capacitance. Increasing our resistance is going to be difficult. Uh, the resistance is going to be mainly defined by the output resistance of one stage and the input resistance of the following stage. Um, and it's going to be difficult to interfere with that without affecting the performance of the amplifier uh, and the loading and so forth. The other option is increasing the capacitance. And that's, uh, that's typically the route that we are going to take. Now, Notice that we are trying to shift this pole significantly. And so in order to accomplish that, we will need to significantly increase the capacitance um, you know, at the interface uh, that corresponds to that particular pole. Designing or fabricating large capacitors in integrated circuits uh, becomes impractical. And so we're going to take advantage of the Miller effect in order to be able to achieve a large capacitor value with a small um, with a small capacitance with small capacitor. So basically, we can do the following. Um, I'm going to write it here. Uh, Miller compensation. It is term Miller compensation because you're going to be uh, taking advantage of the Miller effect in order to um, increase the value of your capacitance the effective value of your capacitance. So basically we're going to add a capacitor across gain stage the advantage of this is that due to the multiplicative multiplicative effect, um, Miller effect, and we're going to be able to implement a large capacitance using a small capacitor. So can implement large capacitance using a much smaller capacitor.
If you recall, the Miller capacitance was approximately equal to uh, the gain of the amplifier, the absolute value of the gain, uh, times the um, feedback capacitor. It was uh, really, you know, uh, one minus the gain, but uh, approximately equal to the gain, especially if the gain is much, much larger than one, which is going to be the case in op amps. And so basically what I have is the following. I have modified my system. This is still my differential amplifier input stage. I have a gain stage, which I'm going to represent like this. An inverting gain stage. And an output stage. V1, V2. And what I'm going to do, or what I have done in order to shift uh, my frequency response, the way that I have indicated there, is basically add a capacitor across the feedback between input and output of the gain stage. And if you remember that capacitor is going to be uh, to appear multiplied at the input, um, multiplied times approximately the gain. Um, therefore, I can implement um, a certain capacitance with a capacitor that is the gain times smaller than if I were just adding a capacitor directly from here to ground. Okay, so that's how Miller effect is, in this case, helping us. In the case of, for example, a common emitter amplifier, it wasn't helping us because it was decreasing the bandwidth of our amplifier. But in this particular case, when we're doing Miller compensation, that's precisely what we want. We want to decrease the bandwidth of the amplifier. Uh, why do we want to decrease the bandwidth of the amplifier? Because it's going to guarantee stability. Um, and if you actually look at the data sheet for an op-amp and you look at its frequency response, you will see that the open-loop frequency response, um, the bandwidth of the open-loop system is actually very small. You will see that sometimes this first pole is at uh, frequency locations of as low as 10 hertz. Um, why is that? Well, because um, it's an internally compensated OPA, meaning they have uh, internally including a included a capacitor uh, in the feedback path between the input stage um, and the or across the gain stage, basically between the input stage and the output stage. Uh, and the purpose of that capacitor, that's is termed a Miller compensation capacitor or simply a compensation capacitor. Uh, how can they still, you know, uh, get away with an amplifier that has a bandwidth of 10 hertz and still be useful? And the answer is the amplifier in open loop has a very large gain. As we decrease the gain of the amplifier by applying negative feedback, we're essentially increasing the bandwidth by the amount of feedback. And so an op amp, typically in open loop configuration, um, is not going to be a useful device to use as a voltage amplifier. It's going to have very small bandwidth, very large gain, uh, gain that is not very controlled. It's going to vary with process variations. But as soon as we add negative feedback, we decrease the gain, make the gain more stable, and increase our bandwidth. All right, so that's, uh, that's the trade-off there. I never drew the phase response here, but uh, you can gather that I'm going to reach minus 45 degrees at the location of my first pole. So it's going to look something like this. And then um, if I haven't changed anything about the second pole, the second part shouldn't have changed much. Um, that's in essence uh, what it is. Nowadays, most op amps that you can find are compensated. Uh, some of them will not be, especially if you're talking about op amps that may be used for comparators. Um, the reason why we wouldn't want to compensate an op amp all the time, like why wouldn't we want to make it always stable, is because you're giving up something, right? You're giving up bandwidth, uh, which directly relates to the speed of an op amp. And so you're going to be able to achieve uh, a faster op amp if you don't apply frequency compensation, uh, but yet you're going to have to deal with potential instability. So you're going to have to be uh, smart enough to be able to externally compensate your op amp uh, based on the um, range of frequencies that you expect for your input signal. In the case of an op amp like the 741, uh, they're internally compensated under all conditions, and so they have provided uh, or they have applied a fairly uh, substantial amount of compensation. 
Um, you can see the capacitor feedback capacitor will be in the order of you know uh, picofarads, tens of picofarads, a lot of the time. And again, it's not going to be the fastest stop amp, probably not the one that you're going to be using for uh, building a comparator, but um, it guarantees that it's always stable. So you're able to use it, uh, and even if you're you know don't know much about feedback. Uh, compensation and stability, you're able to use it without running into problems of oscillation. So, easier to use, uh, better stability, less speed. And I think that covers uh, pretty much everything about frequency compensation. Uh, we're going to next see some examples of how we will go about uh, selecting the right capacitor for a particular, to frequency compensate a particular system. Thank you.